Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. What I'm going to do today is really focus on four things, uh, really centered around the whole concept of risk and managing risk, but redefining or thinking about how we define risk and how we begin to manage risk and how data is really the centerpiece of being able to do that. And so I'm really going to build on what Jonathan has talked about, which is looking at how an individual clinician might be looking at an individual patient or population and look at the broader issues and Im implications of this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to really look at the changing face of risk and what is the core of, of risk management. And the key here is really beginning to define what do we mean by risk because healthcare is a bit of a problem in terms of having a dialogue about almost anything because terms become loaded. Risk management is a loaded term. I still haven't figured out what an electronic medical record is. Uh, is it somewhere where I write a bunch of text? Is it something that has a lot of discrete uh, uh, data entered into it? How do I use it? None of this is really defined. So in terms of managing risk and for the purposes of today's discussion, we're going to talk about risk based on what the dictionary tells us. And very simple, the possibility that something unpleasant may happen. Now isn't that interesting? Something unpleasant may happen. It's about the future. It's not about now. Whatever has happened, happened. It's about managing the future. The second thing I will maybe refer to is this term business, risk management business. Well, what is business? Is it about making lots of money? Is it about putting the patient second and the money first? No. If we look at the dictionary, it's about work to be done on matters or matters to be attended to. It's just what you do day to day. So if I talk about risk healthcare as being a risk management business, what I'm talking about is managing the future, managing the progression of disease, trying to delay that, trying to retard that. It's about managing the future. Now, let's look at healthcare. We've got a lot of terms out there, accountable care organizations, medical home. I wonder whether my home in Boulder, Colorado is a medical home. Bundling, a bunch of new terms out there. Basically, we've all grown up under a fee-for-service healthcare system. In a fee-for-service system, we focus on organizations, we focus on efficiency. Uh, in order to maximize our revenue as a fee-for-service organization, we focus on minimizing our costs, and in particular, minimizing our marginal costs. That is, for every procedure we do, or sub-procedure element of that, we want to actually have the minimal cost possible in order to maximize our revenue. The IT in such a situation really focuses on standardization. What we're trying to do is what I call command and control. We're trying to implement standardized processes so that our costs are minimized. We focus on workflow efficiencies. And if you look at the predominant IT systems in the marketplace today, that's how they're built, that's how they're designed, that's the core of what they do. Notice I've not mentioned the patient anywhere in any of this. In this situation, the administrator, those who plan these systems, those who are, oversee those systems, they are the primary business risk managers. They manage the financial risk. They do that again through command and control. That's, that's where we've been. Where we're going is what I call risk-based reimbursement. Now this is not, I'm not talking about you get paid because you have outcome uh, measure or metrics at a certain level. I'm talking about that you actually have financial risk for the patient that if the patient walks across the street and gets hit by a car, you're picking up the tab, not somebody else. This is full risk. And what ends up happening is the centerpiece is not the organization, it's the patient. And the most important thing is not efficiency, although it's always important, but it's effectiveness. How well do I do things? So minimizing the future liabilities, my future liabilities is very, very important in this situation because these diseases are progressive. 
If I minimize the progression of the disease, for example, I minimize my future potential costs. So what I'm really trying to do is for every time that patient encounters the healthcare system, I want to maximize the effectiveness of that encounter to minimize the need for further encounters. It's a very different way of thinking. And it's a very different way of thinking about costs. In this instance, the IT really needs to focus on the patient and personalizing care. And secondly, it's focusing on clinical effectiveness, the sorts of things that Jonathan talked about. And I would argue that the key business risk manager in that situation is, in fact, the clinician. Because the clinician is making the key decisions about the patient and what needs to happen next. And if those decisions are wrong or if they're delayed, your costs go up. And in order to minimize costs, what we're doing is focusing on quality. Now, the foundation of this, to use a term which is also loaded in healthcare, are experiments. Chronic disease, that which we're focusing on, are biologically complex and manifest differently across patients. Again, each and every patient is different. If we're going to optimize care, we need to optimize care for each patient individually. This is very different than under fee-for-service where everything is standardized. Because, in fact, under fee-for-service, we don't care about the outcomes. In fact, in a perverse way, we actually would prefer worse outcomes because we may make more revenue. But under a risk-based system, it's a very, very different attitude. Secondly, our ability to understand and to respond to complexity in a timely and effective manner is key to re delaying or retarding the progression of disease. I may understand the problem 10 days later because I've got some great database that I've, I've looked at, but by that time the patient's been unhospitalized, they've been transfused, and may, may even have died. Timeliness and effectiveness have to go together. Very important. Again, that's something that, that Jonathan was showing you. This is a critical piece. We have a tremendous amount of literature and talk about evidence-based medicine. The studies about evidence-based medicine. Alvin Feinstein, some of whom uh, some of you will know of Alvin Feinstein, great Yale epidemiologist, has looked at this stuff in excruciating detail. Evidence-based medicine has limited value particularly when it comes to dealing with the individual patient. It simply cannot serve as the foundation for moving forward in this risk-based environment. Now, why do I emphasize this? Because we are now talking about accountable care organizations. There are lots and lots of companies out there, some of whom I know quite well, who are putting together enormous databases based on population level data and evidence, and they're going to say, this is how you're going to manage your risk as an accountable care organization. And I ask myself, how can you possibly do that? How can you possibly do that effectively? Care ultimately remains a heuristic experimental process, and we'll go into experimental in a moment, managed collaboratively across a lifetime continuum of the patient, particularly with chronic conditions. And it needs to be focused on the whole patient, not the cardiovascular issue or not the diabetes. In fact, we divide these comorbidities into comorbidities really as a convenience for us. Each and every patient has a condition that we've subdivided into these artifacts that we call diabetes, uh, end-stage renal disease, whatever. They're all interrelated. They're really all one, and we need to be able to approach the, the patient in that fashion. So each act or treatment can be regarded as an experiment planned by physicians to change the course of an experiment started by nature. Very, very important concept. The necessity both for making a prediction and appraising a change is what makes medical treatment such a difficult experiment. Believe me, economists have it easy. They do all their forecasting, but they're never held accountable for anything. Okay, uh, this again was Alvin Feinstein pointing this out. Unfortunately, in some circles, this concept has been lost. 
The cost problem, in my view, is very simple. Number one, we're not as smart as we think we are. The amount of knowledge that we know, clinical knowledge, we knowable compa know compared to what is knowable is a mere fraction of the possibilities. And that's made much more difficult by the fact that each and every person is different. We have to also manage the whole patient individually if we're going to do this effectively. And that patient exists in a continuum from their home to vacation to the hospital, wherever. So that we really need to rethink the hospital as being the community, where our traditional hospital is a mere node on the network, the bricks and mortar. The bricks and mortar of all this, in my view, is effective, a new form of effective data management. And we'll go into this as we go forward. But I've thrown up two quotes here which may be of interest. Uh, this is one, and then I'll tell you who did them and when. But for many investigators, the new informational technology of computers has not been an exciting, uh, not used an exciting, as an exciting incentive for improving existing concepts and data, but merely as an instrument for automating the status quo. For some people in this room, that may be a familiar statement. Now, here is a study that was re recently done, 4,000 hospitals, including the 100 most wired. The conclusion of the study was that more information technology may merely improve scores without actually improving care. In fact, there are no studies apart from one that Victor and Jonathan have published in the world that I am aware of, and I've reviewed probably 500 different studies that actually relate the use of information systems to outcomes. Now, I don't mean vaccination rates, which is one that, for example, Kaiser published, but I mean mortality, morbidity, hospitalizations rates, complications, et cetera, et cetera. I know because I was involved in the national program for IT, and there was no, in the UK, that huge, what was really supposed to be a $50 billion program, there was no justification for it whatsoever. Uh, it's certainly not in the literature. Uh, the top quote was from Alvin Feinstein in 1968. The bottom study was done uh, in 2009. Not much has changed. So we're going to talk about rethinking the medical record. First of all, very simple concept. The conventional electronic medical record, in my view, focuses primarily on what happened to the patient. It remains an archival instrument. What we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about Rogerson, but in a different light, is what I call an analytic medical record, which really focuses on what should happen next why and for whom. It's about managing risk. It's about managing the future. The slides look much better on here, by the way. My. OK, so first of all, let's go and look at Rogerson and how, what kind of system they have. Basically, they have a single database that fully integrates clinical, financial, and administrative data in a single data model. That data model addresses everything throughout the organization regionally, patient care, clinical studies, financial management, billing, compliance issues, resource management, et cetera, et cetera. The heart is it's a bunch of gumballs. It breaks down all of the different things that happen in healthcare, signs and symptoms, uh, diagnoses, procedures, into their most discrete but meaningful gumballs that allow me to, at any moment, reorganize them for the problem at hand. So in a sense, a bill is just reorganizing the gumballs. An event list is just reorganizing the gumballs. It provides an enormous amount of flexibility. And the point is, it's not a technician, a programmer. It is the clinician themselves can re who can reorganize those gumballs however they want. It is also done across professional organizational and geographic boundaries. So Rogerson is actually involved with organizations that are disparate, not just New York Presbyterian Hospital. It is involved with inpatient, outpatient, uh, medical offices, and also the home. So the same system that's managing your inpatient experience in the ward at New York Presbyterian is exactly the same system that's monitoring you if you're on home daily nocturnal hemodialysis. So this is a an outline, hopefully you can see it, uh, of the Institute and, and that vast collection of data. Incidentally, one of the uh, 
oh, and incidentally down here, this is really a system within a system. So of course, the hospital has the EPIC system, it has the Eclipsis system, but this is actually run as an autonomous system that then can interface and pass data back and forth as required. So everything is actually managed through this particular system. I'm going to just uh, point out a couple of different things. First of all, the New York Hospital Lab, the way it's set up is that all of the lab data comes to this system that's generated by every patient. And then it picks out those patients which are tracked by Rogasin and brings in the data. So that means if a physician that you didn't know about orders a test on your patient, that data is in your system as quickly as it's in any other system. So you know, so if the patient was in the ER, had a bunch of tests done, you come in the morning, you already have the results there. You didn't have to request them, they're already there. Secondly, in the bottom right, we have real-time, if you can see that, real-time remote monitoring, for example, of patients on dialysis. And then thirdly, going to this notion of community, the, the hospital is anywhere. I remember uh, when they went live, I think it was 1999, with transplant coordinators using the system. And the first transplant that was coordinated through the system was actually done on the Midtown Manhattan bus. As the transplant, this was 1999, so that's a long time ago in sort of technology terms. The coordinator had a computer with a cellular link, so she got a uh, call that an organ was available, a page, was able to go into the medical record, do the procurement, get off the bus and go home. So that's really what, when we talk about community-based patient care and system, it's about being care available anytime, anyplace, anywhere. And here are some data uh, about Rogerson, but what I really wanted to highlight is there's a lot of data. So they're collecting between 10 and 22,000 clinical data points per patient per year for end-stage renal disease patients, per, for example. But this isn't a bunch of data that's sitting there doing nothing. The ability to separate signal from noise, to be able to separate that data which is useful at any moment or not is profound. So anyway, enhancing clinical investigation. It's about accessing any time, any place, a comprehensive, coded, and analyzable collaborative history. Social workers, dietitians, physicians, nurses, it's all coming together and it's all transparent. Be able, the ability to generate a complete and concise interpretable event list, for example, organized for any particular perspective in seconds. I'm a cardiologist, I'm looking at the data, I would look at it differently. I'm a nephrologist, I look at it differently. Let's say I have a particularly complex patient that I want to look at the data in a unique way, well, the data can be set up so when the patient comes in, it automatically presents me the data in that form for that particular patient encounter. Quickly retrieve, organize, and correlate data within and across different domains. That's what a lot of people don't realize. It's not a matter of looking at blood pressure, looking at blood pressure over time. I need to understand how did the patient's blood pressure over time change in relation to a whole bunch of other variables, including, for example, the use of medications. I need to be able to correlate it. I need to, and rather than creating this vast spreadsheet in my head, I want a tool that allows me to create the spreadsheet on the computer, in effect. So the other thing, and Jonathan, this is what Jonathan showed, is this need to be able to interrelate the individual to the subpopulation. That is, if I find a problem in the individual, I want to be able to go to the relevant subpopulation, identify where the, there, that problem exists there, and what did other people learn, and then go back and relate this back and forth. Very, very important. And then finally, I'm constantly learning as a clinician, individual. I would like to put rules into the system that take my knowledge and tell me something or tell my colleagues something in relation to patients, but do it proactively. So what happens is once those combination of uh, events occurs, then the system will do something. It page me, send me an email, put an educational note on a flow sheet, whatever it would be. Okay, it's about feedback. The key in all of this is there is no need for technical support. One of the systems that was kicked out of the UK, for example, one of the big American vendors, I remember vividly, they, the clinicians had to tell the vendor exactly how they wanted to look at the date or the data in the design phase. That meant it was completely hard-coded and once the system was deployed, you couldn't change anything. Uh, it was really quite remarkable. So there was no way to query the data uh, in a flexible fashion. And of course, once we start to do this, what you find, and you can look through Rogus, and you get a whole range of systemic benefits. 
whether you're coordinating care better, where you're identifying problems earlier, you're reducing the complexity of the disease. One of the benefits of reducing complexity, severity, et cetera, et cetera, is you probably need fewer clinical staff in the end. And we'll talk to that in a moment. So real benefits. Jonathan talked about this a little bit, but in their study of, of an EMR, what they found is that they reduced hospital admissions up to 39% below national. That's a pretty important figure. If you're ROGUS and becomes an accountable care organization, that's a lot of money. Reduce mortality to well, well below national. Now here's something else. This is quite interesting. They in fact treat 34% more patients per clinical staff member, or if you reverse it, they use 25% fewer F clini clinical FTEs than the national average. They're delivering much better care, much, much more efficiently. Okay, and, and Jonathan has shown some of these I won't go into. So is this an anomaly? Well, not really. The methodology that Rogerson uses has been applied in a number of different settings. This is a report that we did for the Institute of Medicine numbers and numbers of years ago, showing in Cincinnati this te techniques had a profound impact on care during the 1980s. It was a 13-year study that was reported to Congress. Uh, when Jonathan was the other side of town uh, at UMDC Columbia, we did another study, we looked at uh, what was happening there. Uh, interesting, this particular patient population had a large number, about 13% HIV AIDS patients uh, and about 17% drug addicted. In fact, the mortality rate with the AIDS patients was far better than the national figure. That model, what did we, what has happened at Rogus and we applied, we when I was involved uh, with the information system company a number of years ago, we applied that same model across a whole province in Canada, it was the first clinical information system in Canada in the province of uh, Saskatoon, or in uh, Saskatchewan, excuse me. And there what we did is again we took a patient population and focused on managing the whole patient, in this case chronic kidney disease patients. So one of the models that Rogerson demonstrates, and I think it's actually an important model to think about, is this ability to carve out subpopulations and begin to manage those subpopulations, the whole person, within the larger systems. And, and I say that because if we start with grandiose visions, that we're going to do everything for everybody, they're bound to fail. If we carve out discrete pieces and begin to model and then work those outward, I think we're more, much more likely to be successful. And that's what I started to do in the UK uh, with a project that uh, started uh, in about 2002. I spent a number of years working with people from Parliament to uh, senior N NHS executives down to physicians and nurses and patients. And m what I wanted to do there was to really build a healthcare system that works within a healthcare system. And the challenge to me is if we're going to think about healthcare in terms of risk, there are three types of core types of risk. One is financial risk, second is clinical risk, and there's a third one, which is really from the patient's perspective, is lifestyle risk. That is, I develop a chronic condition, I want to be able to maintain as close as possible the lifestyle I have. And so what I do today will impact whether or not I can do that. And then how do you bring and align these three elements so we're actually moving in the same direction rather than in an adversarial fashion? Now, one of the interesting things about the NHS is that the NHS has the lifetime financial risk for a patient. That's very important. One of the things that was never said in the healthcare reform debates, to the extent we really debated anything, but in the discussions, is that people flip plans too often. If people change plans every two to three years, the payer has no financial incentive in your well-being, none. I've been involved with disease management programs. I met with a very uh, large pharmaceutical company here in New York a few years ago who had a very prominent disease management program. If you look at these programs, they tend to come out of marketing budgets. Okay, these are not real businesses. These are PR. And from the, you know, the, the reality is, if you're the CEO of United Healthcare or whatever, you're not going to make the investment because the pay, their argument is the patient leaves and they go somewhere else and somebody else benefits. Now, of course, the system would benefit, but nobody 
thinks that way. So how often people flip plans is very, very important. In the NHS, they have the lifetime risk. However, you know, we talk about, oh, should we go to a single payer system? Well, maybe. But what we have to think about is how are, is risk and money managed trickled down through the system. So although the NHS had the lifetime risk, managers were, man were performance judged based upon whether or not they overspent their budget or not. That was pure and simple. So when I was living in the UK for about 20 years, around Christmas every year, hospital wards would shut because it was towards the end of the financial year and they'd overspent their budget. Nobody was held accountable for care. Nobody, so they just shut down. It was quite a, a remarkable uh, experience. So when we're thinking about this whole issue of single payer and risk and this and that, we have to really, and if you're going to be an accountable care organization, you have to think about how you actually manage that risk down, you know, permeate that risk management process down into how you budget, how do you account for cost, et cetera, et cetera. In the NHS, the key things in terms of reforms is they moved under labor to patient-centric cost accounting, which means, or patient-centric budget, I should say. That means now in the NHS, the money is around the patient. And it's not just the health money, it is now increasingly the social money. The patient today can go and get care from anybody they want. The primary, the primary care provider is fully capitated today. So they are a combination of medical home and accountable uh, care organization in one. The secondary care is paid based on activity at the moment, but the critical piece is you can't overspend your budget and deny care. You'll be legally prosecuted. You have a duty of care um, within that system. So I'm going to go quickly through this. But So in the UK, we developed a approach that said we want to really promote a whole systemic whole patient approach to both commissioning, that is buying and delivering services. We want to be able to identi better identify and uh, understand and respond to the personal needs of each patient. One of the critical issues in the UK is, and you get it here as well, is that specialist services tend to be in large district hospitals and the doctors don't like to leave those hospitals. So it's very difficult to get specialist services out into uh, remotely located areas. Now I was speaking with Barry about how big the United States is and, and of course very different from the UK, but I will tell you that if you live in Kent, the county of Kent on the coast, the English Channel, it's quicker for you to take a ferry to France to go to the hospital than it is to go to your local district hospital if you have an emergency. Uh, the traffic gridlock is just horrific. Uh, it's difficult to get around. So we want to focus in this project, focus on raising service quality, and obviously at the end of the day, release scarce resources. So really what we're focusing, what our project's focusing on is how do we create a large regional data set, a la Rogerson, with Rogerson really being an exemplar, that's going to improve understanding, monitoring, coordinating care, and accounting for care. And that accounting is very interesting because in the NHS, all you, the way budgets are done is they're all accounted for, you account for costs on a departmental and organizational basis, not a patient basis. So nobody really understands what they spend on a patient. And as a consequence of that, there's no understanding that if I invest a little bit upstream, I'll actually have far lower costs in terms of ER emissions downstream. Um, so this patient-centric cost accounting is very, very important. Again, a unified approach to stakeholder needs. If you think about it, if you have a proper database, you have everything that we all talk about as if they're separate entities. You have the personal health record. All the data is coming out of your own record presented in a particular fashion. You have the system for ma managing uh, patient care from the inpatient to the home. The, what's called the commissioner or payer actually gets payment data, real-time updates to their budget from the same system. And those public health officers have all of the discrete patient data uh, that allows them to, we're going to skip, skip through that and we'll skip through that. I'm going to just skip through that and just say, 
so this particular project, what we did is we carved out a particular patient population, which is patients with chronic kidney disease who've seen specialists. And so that's roughly 5,000 patients, uh, seven dialysis centers, um, several hundred uh, uh, workers, but it, we'll go into primary care in a second. So we've carved them out. In this particular region, which is two counties, 422 dialysis patients alone cost as much as 35 million pounds a year. Uh, these patients are the most hospitalized, one of the most hospitalized uh, in the country, just second, in fact, to sickle cell anemia patients. And we won't go into the financial benefits. Uh, one of the things about the project in terms of releasing resources is important to see that as we did a, uh, a study that looked at the cumulative benefits after five years, and in fact, just looking at the ESRD patient population, depending on some of our assumptions, you may release anywhere from 24 to 96 million pounds uh, cumulative amount in that short period of time based on those 422 patients. And that's it. We've got two more slides, and that's, that's it. The, the, I think the important thing was how, how we were focusing on trying to integrate in primary care uh, into this equation. There are over 1,000 primary care physicians in that region. And the primary care physician is the one that is really in charge of the renal patients. And so what we said to the primary care folks is, you don't have access to this complete data set from secondary care. We'll give you browser access to data that you've never had before. And the primary care provider, as the uh, budget holder and the one at risk, actually wanted that because what happens with primary care in the UK is they once the patient goes into secondary care, they completely lose touch with the patient. They have no idea what's going on and no way to manage their costs. So the way to get primary care to buy into this is actually to give them real-time update in terms of what's happening with their patients at any moment in time. And then finally, this focus, the initial focus on CKD, and then the notion is to be able to branch out uh, from one patient population to another as an incremental uh, ex expansion. And the only thing I just leave this with is that there are a whole range of issues in terms of today's conversation uh, that begin to arise. One is this whole issue of consumer choice and people flipping plans. Is that good or bad? Uh, meaningful use in terms of data systems. We talk about meaningful use. Jonathan quite rightly brought up the concept maybe we should be talking about meaningful design and use uh, of systems. Uh, can risk-based reimbursement deliver uh, without the proper patient-level data? Uh, we can see what Rogerson can do, but can other organizations actually deal with this risk-based reimbursement issue without having that, that kind of data? Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you.